Hello and welcome to the third episode of my baseball interview series. My name is Jeremy Frank and today I am joined by Bailey of Foolish Baseball. I'm sure most of you people listening to this know who he is, but Bailey, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Hey, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. I'm here. I'm in black and white. Your camera's not working. We're just, I look like I'm a detective in an old noir film and I'm cool with it. Let's go. You should make, you should make all of your baseball bits videos in black and white from now on. I yeah. think it's. I think it's a nice a nice touch. I thought about um, there's a time when I thought about expanding it where I would make a series called um, Football Flicks and it would be NFL type videos in the style of an old movie. So you're not too far off. Okay, yeah. So anyway, so baseball bits for people who don't know it. What is what is baseball bits? Or is it what are baseball? Is baseball bits like a plural thing or a singular? I think it's probably singular, right? It's like a series. Yeah. Well, it's like a title. So it'd be like, what is Baseball Bits? Yeah, sure. Um, baseball Bits is a series of videos that I do on YouTube. They are 10 to 15 minutes long. And I guess they would kind of qualify under the kind of video essay type format. The, the new thing, it's not really that new, but one of the hot things on YouTube seems to be people that are able to blend um, information with education. So, I'm sorry, uh, information with uh, entertainment. Um, so it's, I'm trying to basically make the analytical side of the game, um, more accessible to people, uh, particularly people who do get their sports on YouTube. Um, for me, for example, that's actually not where I get most of my sports. I, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. I read the blogs. Um, but I'm just trying to make that aspect of the game, particularly sort of the new sabermetric type stats accessible to a wider audience. And uh, I found that video is a really interesting format to do that. Yeah, I think in my opinion, I think you're one of the uh, best people at like getting like sabermetric stuff out there to people who like otherwise would not be like involved in like advanced stats or anything. Because I think you do a really great job of explaining how things that are more like advanced can like, like I remember the Andrelton Simmons video. I think you, you did a great job of like explaining the defensive run stage concept to people who probably would reject it otherwise. But I think you did a good job putting it into perspective how it relates. I think you do a really good job with that for, for pretty much all of the advanced stats and things, concepts that you try and describe to people who may not have heard of them before. But um, I do, so you're on, you're on Twitter and YouTube as Foolish Baseball. And I actually, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I do think your Twitter is actually better than your YouTube. I, I know a lot of people are like, Oh, foolish. But you have way more. You have like 100,000 subscribers on YouTube and like only 20,000 on Twitter, 20,000 20, followers. But I, I do think that your Twitter game is actually stronger than your YouTube. So what well, I guess that doesn't have anything to do with this question I'm about to ask. Like what goes into both your YouTube videos and like your, your tweets on Twitter? Well, so I'm glad that you did point out Twitter. And that's been a really important tool for the channel for the past year or so. I'm kind of of the opinion that... Um, YouTube, you have this uh, this algorithm that can promote your videos, and uh, that makes it different from other social media sites. Like, for example, I made a YouTube video when I had just a few hundred subscribers. It was about Justin Verlander, and you know, hundreds of thousands of people have seen that now. And that's because not of hard work that I did promoting it. It's because of what YouTube did and something in the YouTube recommendation system. The algorithm liked it. Um, whereas on Twitter. Uh, if you put something out, you know, obviously you can grow by getting retweets and um, getting exposure on your tweets. But um, when you can get people to follow you from YouTube to another platform, I think that's a good test of just how much people care about what you have to say. So you pointed out, you know, I have closing in on 100,000 subscribers. Fingers crossed that'll come in the next few weeks. Um, and then 23,000 on Twitter. But if you were to compare that to the type of social media following that a lot of YouTubers have, that's actually a pretty good ratio. I have about, you know, for every four or five YouTube subscribers, one Twitter follower. But uh, I put a lot of effort into Twitter. I put a lot of effort into growing it. I'm having a good time. But, yeah, I mean, you bring it up. Like, I, I genuinely spend as much time, like, on Twitter thinking about tweets as I do making the videos for uh, Foolish Baseball and Baseball Bits. Yeah, and I think that there's, there, there's like... There's like a foolish baseball brand almost like with your YouTube videos and your tweets, but they're very different. Like your YouTube videos, way more serious. Obviously, you do make some some jokes once in a while in your YouTube video. But like, like, like you said, like way more like like information, educational, I guess you could say, where your tweets are kind of more like just like funny, like things that you I'm sure you spend a lot more time thinking of them than um, it, it appears to the uh, 
the reader, but th- they're very, very funny tweets. And you, you remind me a lot of uh, John Boys, and I'm sure you get that comparison a lot. Do you have you talked to John before? And like, do you how do you how do you feel about that comparison? Uh, I've never talked to John. Um, I so as far as like my relationship, my parasocial relationship with John, I should say. Um, I've seen some of his videos. I haven't seen all his videos. Um, I've been recently enjoying Fumble Dimension, which is his current project. Yeah. Um, which is he does with uh, Kofi from SB Nation, who I have talked to quite a bit actually. Okay. Um, and um, but yeah, I think, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Like, um, I'm definitely like I think my videos definitely are influenced by John to some extent, but I think the Twitter game is probably even more influenced by him, and that's. That's my John Boyce fandom. I think he's just a great guy on Twitter to follow. And um, so I, I really admire just, like, his uh, sense of humor. And then as far as, like, maybe YouTube people who I um, uh, feel influenced by, I think there's a guy called Summoning Salt who, um, if you're kind of into the gaming scene, uh, you're probably familiar with. But if not, he's a guy who makes sort of these histories of video game speed running the act of trying to beat a video game as fast as possible and these are i mean he put out a video just uh, a few days ago these are like sometimes very lengthy up to an hour long and um i yeah i just think as far as um just trying to cover something kind of niche you know for me it's you know advanced baseball stats for him it's people trying to beat um punch out as fast as possible i mean it you know and introducing that to a wider audience i think he's someone who I have definitely um, learned from as I go and throughout my video creation process. Interesting. So I know my my favorite tweet of yours is the one that says Mike Trout, and I know a lot of people try and copy that. They don't get the they don't get the like the the outreach on those on those kind of uh, those style tweets as you do. What, what about your your Mike Trout tweet? does does so much better than say Devin Fink tweeting last night Bryce Harper I was right. I was FaceTiming him he's like oh we were talking about Bryce Harper and he's like I'm like Devin you tweet about Bryce Harper so much and then he was like oh watch this and he like tweets Bryce Harper and gets like 20 likes or something and if mm-hmm. you tweet Bryce Harper even even if it wasn't Mike Trout let's say if you tweet Bryce Harper right now I'm standing send the over under at like 450 likes like what about what about your your style of tweeting like makes that like a popular tweet it's just on brand, you know. Um, yeah, right. That's how I feel. That's what yeah. that's my answer would be for you. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's you know I've, I mean, I've sort of it started with Mike Trout's baseball reference page, right? And now it's just sort of devolved into the this da da <laughs> writing Mike Trout in all lowercase every month and seeing how many likes I can get on Twitter. Do you keep and, you have like a you have like a graph? Are you keeping track of like your if you do it every month, is it like, yeah. do you have a graph of all your, or like a, an Excel spreadsheet or something where all you have like the re- retweets and likes for each of your Mike Trout tweets? No, I should, but I do know that the one I did a few days ago, I think was the most I've gotten on one so far. And I've done it once a month for the past, probably since the off season started. So that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. You gotta keep going with that and make a, like in like four years, make a video on like, I tweeted Mike Trout 50 times and here's what happened or something yeah. like that. It'd also be funny to me just cause I mean, He's not super active on social media, but he is on Twitter sometimes. Like, it'd be really funny if he saw that one day. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he is on TikTok, too. Have you thought about branching out onto TikTok? TikTok really actually pisses me off because um, people are like, well, obviously, this this is a very selfish thing to say. But, like, I'll, like, like meet someone and they'll be like, oh, like, like, someone will spring up my Twitter or something. And they'll be like, oh, like, one of my friends is TikTok famous and has, like, 100,000 followers or whatever. But, like, <laughs> it's so different between, like, TikTok and Twitter because so many more people use TikTok. And, like, it's just so different with followers. There are so many more people that are, like, famous on TikTok than on Twitter. But I feel like your your videos could be, like, toned down a little bit. But it's hard with, the like, the, the short format of TikTok. But have you thought about moving um, into TikTok-style videos? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't. I don't know. I like I kind of enjoy like the short videos that I post on Twitter, I think would be a good example of a TikTok style video I could make. Um, you know, I, I'll, I don't make that that often. But yeah, I think I'm just TikTok is like the first thing that came out that I that I feel like I'm too old for. Like <laughs> I'm 24 and I, I sincerely just don't quite understand it. I did. I remember Vine. And TikTok's really similar to Vine, but the lip syncing aspect of TikTok, which not everyone does, but that aspect of it, I just don't. I can't wrap my head around it. I'll just leave that to the kids. TikTok is just all over the place. Like, I I downloaded it probably, like, six or seven months ago, and it really distracted me from schoolwork. Like, it's pretty sad. Like, (laughs) I, like, 
I'd be like going on TikTok at like nine at night. I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my math homework at ten. And then I look up, I'm like, oh, I, like, it's been an hour, right? And it's like midnight. I'm like, how did that even happen? It's kind of, it's addicting in that way, which I guess it works out so well. But it's all over the place too. It's not just like lip syncing videos. It's like random people like dancing or like just random, like there are sports videos on there. It's just all over the place, which I think is kind of, kind of fun. But anyways, so how old are you? 24. Oh, you said you were 24. Okay. Yeah. yeah you said that earlier. Okay. So how long have you been like doing youtube videos for for baseball uh i think i started spring of 20 trying to get the year right 18 so that would have been two years ago um at the time i was uh i was living in germany um i was in really? hamburg germany yeah i uh i was after i had graduated college in the spring of 2017 um i had uh where i studied uh, among other things german <laughs> Um, we're getting into the whole thing. Uh, I had, uh, was accepted to this fellowship program, um, which, uh, is administered by, uh, the United States state department and, uh, Germany's Bundestag, which is, uh, their, their parliament. That's Um, awesome. Yeah. So I, I was spent a year in Germany after I graduated college basically. And when I was in Germany also, I, um, uh, I, part of my, uh, German experience was that I volunteered at a sports club in Germany and helped with their, like, a couple, like, kind of uh, uh, baseball teams that had been around for a while and were, um, uh, it was just really interesting to see that side of the game. And um, that's what kind of got me thinking about, well, how can I, how can I work in baseball uh, when I get back to the United States? And um, for me, that wasn't ever YouTube. YouTube was just something I was doing for fun. I was a big fan of the Out of the Park Baseball series. And so the first videos I uploaded were kind of tutorials about how to play that because the new game had come out. And I kind of knew what I was doing at the time, but I noticed a lot of people really felt unsure, so I wanted to help them. So those two things weren't necessarily related. But at some point, it became married into this thing of how can I um, work in baseball when I get back to the United States? And that ended up actually being the YouTube channel that I still do today. So... So before like before baseball was on your radar or something like you could you could do for like a full time job, like what did you what did you want to do when you were 24 years old, when you were 18? Yeah, I mean, if you asked me when I was 18, I probably would have said sports writer. You know, Um, I definitely remember feeling like I wanted to do that when I was maybe not 18, um, but definitely when I was like, you know, uh, like a high school student, 16 or 17. I was big on like um, what started as school newspaper when I got there and turned into school website while I was there. (laughs) Uh, welcome to the world of new media. But um, uh, yeah, I think when I was in college, I was definitely thinking more along the lines of um, something to do with, um, I knew it was going to be something to do with like marketing or media or video. So um, in the end, I've kind of married both of those things into what has been kind of a, a weird <laughs> independent career. Like, I, I, So here's a really good example, Jeremy. Um, when I was in high school, I did like it did not occur to me or really anybody that you could be a YouTuber for a job. So it's not like I grew up like, Oh, this is what I want to do, you know? And uh, maybe people around your age, like kind of grew up with that knowledge. Like, yeah. For uh, sure. and, e- and even when I was in high school, I think people were making money doing YouTube. It's right. just that it wasn't apparent to me. Um, and it certainly wasn't the, the type of money that you can make now doing it. So I definitely understood that like, Something in sports was definitely something I wanted to do at some point. Something in marketing or uh, media was something I wanted to do at some point. But as far as doing YouTube, I mean, that's all. I mean, that's been only something in the last year or so that's been fully realized. So it's it's not that surprising that I've ended up doing this. But if you explained it to me when I was eighteen, I wouldn't have even still been aware that that's something you can make money doing. So, um, so you've, you've, you just said it, but you've been really like your, your accounts have grown like exponentially in the last year or so. I remember I didn't even know who you were probably 15 months ago. I remember, um, I remember you shouted me out one time and I'm like, Oh, like I thought I followed you back, I think right away or whatever. But then I found you on YouTube and I was like, Oh, this is like, this is pretty cool. And then like, you're one of the most popular like Twitter accounts and YouTube accounts for baseball, just like a year and a half later, not even. So and you, now you now you like do like um it's like sponsorships or like partnerships with the athletic, which I think is really cool. But like, where do you? This might be a hard question for you, but in like five years, 
where do you see Bailey of Foolish Baseball? Like, what do you see yourself doing, and where do you want? What do you want to be doing? Yeah, I mean, so even when I started taking this thing like more seriously, it I don't think the end goal was to still be doing YouTube like I am now. I thought basically I would start doing this, and I, I didn't even see this as like a stable career. So I thought maybe I would do this for a little bit and then get brought on by a team or a right. publication. Um, and I, I would still be interested in that kind of thing. There is, um, I think I would be like really well served. Um, I'll tell you my dream. My dream is to, um, there's this channel for NFL. It's called NFL Throwback. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, I they have, I, like, of, I think I've heard of them before. Yeah. They make like, they'll upload like mini documentary type stuff about a player. They'll upload like, they'll take like an old Hall of Fame player. And with the NFL, they have video of everything. So they can grab like, they can put together like a highlight reel of a defensive back that played in the 50s. And it's quite funny actually to, to imagine someone putting that together in 2020. But um, I would like to, I would like to do the MLB throwback channel and, and basically be like the creative director of that. Just decide what cool old clips get uploaded, what cool old full games get uploaded, what kind of, you know, I could make still my own type of videos where I, I analyze, like, say, a classic game. Uh, I think that would be really cool. I think, um, you know, I don't I don't imagine I'll be doing just straight-up baseball bits five years from now. That's just a, that's just a long time uh, to, to imagine. Um, but I could see myself maybe in a more, like, creative director-type role where, Hopefully, I'm I'm helping other people create as well as creating myself. Gotcha. Yeah, I think a uh, a lot of people criticize um like MLB in specific for for not marketing the game as well as they could be or like marketing the players. But I think um I think what MLB does have that sports may not other sports may not have as well is a lot of people who do like content creators like yourself who are very passionate about the game and whether or not you're affiliated with Major League Baseball, I do think you do a great job of keeping people interested like i'm sure if you put a baseball bets up tomorrow it would get a ton of views compared to i mean there's no sports going on right now and it would still right. bring a lot of attention to whoever it was like i know you said andrelton or I, I know i saw on twitter i think that andrelton simmons watched your video and so did tim lacastro or lacastro however you say his name on the diamondbacks which i think is like crazy that like an independent creator such as yourself can just make a video 15 minutes long like oh this guy's really interesting like what like watch some of these clips or whatever and like look at these stats and like within a couple of days, like the player has seen it himself, which I think yeah, would be, would make sense for MLB to consider like hiring you or MLB or a team specific. Cause you do a really great job of reaching a, a broad audience and like connecting with people who probably don't feel connected by like with, with, by major league baseball, like people like say like, Oh, major league baseball, like doesn't market its best players enough. But mm -hmm. I guess the game does have people like you to do it for them. <laughs> even right. If you're not working for them. Yeah. I mean, I think that's even, you spoke it, I mean, you said it yourself, like you talked about the idea of MLB hiring me. Well, I mean, I'm already promoting the product as it is. So, right. um, and well, you know, I'm, you yeah. <laughs> and I'm happy with that setup too, because that, you know, they don't really mess with me copyright wise. So I'm kind of allowed to exist and they understand it seems that, that I'm promoting their product and, you know, I can, you know, monetize my videos, for example. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's cool. I, one thing that really stood out to me was in terms of like, um, I think before I made like the Tim LaCastro video, I had gotten on a kick and I was really worried that the only way to get people to watch the videos was to make videos about superstars or future superstars. So I think I had a streak where I made videos about like Trout, uh, Kershaw, um, Juan Soto, like those type of people uh, for a while, Willie Mays. And um and then when I got, I decided to make the Tim LaCastro video, it felt like a real uh, risk because I'm making this video, I think probably for the first time, about a player that really not even most baseball fans, I think, had even heard of. Um, Diamondbacks fans had surely heard of him, but but most baseball fans, I would say, hadn't heard of him or right. weren't too familiar with his exploits. So, and the fact that that became an extremely popular video kind of showed me, um, you, you know, really what it comes down to is making a good video. You don't have to, like... For me, I don't have to like piggyback off of someone else's fame. Like I can kind of create the hype myself, and um, I think that manifested itself really interestingly. One day, when a few days after I released the LaCastro video, maybe a week after, someone sent me a, a screenshot of the front page of the Baseball Savant, and on Baseball Savant, the front page is like yep. trending players, 
and uh, so it'll say like how many more views or how many fewer views the player's uh, page has gotten in the in some you know specific time frame, maybe 24 hours. And Tim LeCastro was up like five or six thousand percent, and he was on the front page of Baseball Savant. So that made me know not only people like are into Tim LeCastro and like the video, like even after watching the video, they're looking at the numbers themselves. And I thought that was really cool. And um, yeah, I mean, I haven't like spoken to Tim LeCastro. Uh, we do follow each other on Twitter. He's new to Twitter, but um, I, I I imagine one day uh, I will get to talk to him, and I'm really interested to hear what his perspective on all this is because, uh, you know, it must be weird to wake up one day and 500,000 people have watched a video about you and uh, and you're, you know, uh, you've, you've played, you have maybe 300 played appearances total in the majors, you know, so. Yeah, just pretty much a random player who just has... It's very a very unique skill set, and I think going back to what you said about like the copyright thing um, with like I won't be not wanting to like like do anything to you because you help them, so like there's no reason for them. I think something that they probably learned from is the Rob Friedman thing. I don't know if you were like just like a year ago, I think, and mm-hmm. they they copyrighted him on Twitter, and he got I think he got his account like banned or something for a second, and they had to work something, and everyone was really mad about it. I could not imagine like like the kind of crap that they would get if they did something like with anyone like. Like even remotely as popular as your YouTube, like there's no reason for them to do. It. Like obviously, like copyright is like a, a serious issue, but it helps them way more to just have the video up and boost their popularity than do a very unpopular decision, which would be just harming the content creators. Which people, I mean, people don't really like identify with Major League Baseball, like the company. They they, they like baseball. Right. They don't like oh like like what what like what what are your favorite companies? Oh, Major League Baseball. Like for one, like the people that go to the games wearing like MLB hats. Like no one does that. Like people mm. just like the sport. They don't like the they don't like or dislike the league. Some people do dislike the league. Some people like the league. But you like specifically are like a, like a brand, whereas I think Major League Baseball really isn't a brand. But it could be like it wouldn't help their popularity whatsoever to do anything to harm someone else's brand who probably gets more like interactions in terms of like like their videos or whatever that they put out. But anyways, so um, so besides baseball, like what else? are you interested in? I don't think a lot of people um, like ask, like I know on foolish, on foolish baseball on your Twitter, you mostly tweet about baseball, which is probably good because most of the people follow you for baseball. Mm-hmm. What else do you like to do with your spare time? If you're not working on a video, you're not watching baseball. Yeah. I mean, so uh, I'm really into music. Uh, I'm not a musician myself, but I, I spend a lot of time and have spent a lot of time uh, previously just like kind of reading through like music blogs looking at reviews for old albums there's a website called rate your music i'm on there a lot trying to find new albums to listen to so uh, i listen to i mean all types of music but lately it's been more like kind of 70s 80s new wave post-punk type stuff so i'm kind of into that um i game off and on i would say like now i'm kind of on um i can't really do it Things like that. I find with my hobbies, like I can't really do them half-heartedly and occasionally. So either I'm gaming or I'm not. And yeah. uh, if I am gaming, um, I'm playing probably some Counter Strike, uh, which okay. I've played for off and on love hate relationship for, I mean probably the past like six years or so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, that would be one. I'm trying to get back into running. Now isn't. I'm not really. No one's. <laughs> you get told some bad looks when you go outside. Yeah. No one's told me if it's good to like be outside or not. I think you know? it's okay if you like walk around. Yeah. I think that's like acceptable for yeah. now. Maybe it'll. I don't know. Yeah. You'll, Maybe, you'll go. You'll like run like one time around the block, and then they'll be like, "You have to stay in your house for two months." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, the weather hasn't been good for it anyways. But I think definitely like, um, when the curve starts to flatten and the and the sun's out, I'll definitely be like more into that. Um. Yeah, and then, uh, I don't know, what would be another thing I'm into? Um, oh, um, uh, comedy. You know, I like stand-up comedy a lot. I've I've tried my hand at open mics a few times to uh, mix success, but um, really what <laughs> I YouTube admire has the be- confidence. <laughs> yeah, YouTube has become kind of the creative outlet for that. Like, as soon as I started taking this seriously, it was just like the creative itch had been scratched, so I haven't really done it since I started taking YouTube seriously. It's like, you know, why do I have to get on a stage in front of, you know, 15 people who are also, you know, trying to do their five minutes when I could just uh, fire off a tweet and I know 20,000 people will see it or fire off a video and 100,000 people will see it. So uh, yeah. I like comedy. I respect comedians, but uh, safe to say at this point, my creative itch has been scratched and it's not for me at the moment. Yeah. 
So did you play baseball growing up? I know a lot of people are like, oh, like you're sabermetric nerd. Like has never, yeah. never played the game, like struck out in T-ball. Like were you, uh, did you play baseball? I know a lot of people were like, yeah, I played baseball, but I wasn't that good. Was yeah. that, was that kind of how you were? Well, I mean, I played for the Braves in 2001. Um, I forgot, I forgot about yeah. that. Um, yeah, but, uh, but that was when I was, uh, let's see, I would have been five or six then. So, um, yeah, so, and then I think the oldest age I played baseball was, uh, was probably like, I mean, 11 or 12, you know, something like that. I didn't play in high school, which I, I think a lot of people who work in the industry, even ones who are, weren't like natural athletes or anything like that, or writers, like they probably played in high school still. I didn't because um, I could never stick with a sport when I was younger. Like I would play baseball for a couple of years. I'd play tennis for a couple of years. I played soccer for a couple of years. I ran for a couple of years. And then by the time I got to high school, I wasn't really good enough at any of them. Yep. That's <laughs> uh, not, yeah, I know that yeah. very well. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, it, it's like if I'd stuck with baseball, I surely would have been good enough to play yeah. in like, high school. And I probably would have been pretty good too. But I just didn't stick with it. So when I, by the time I got to high school, I was like, I'm probably just not going to play a sport, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, I wasn't like a bad, I wasn't like bad at baseball, but I wasn't, I clearly was not like, uh, you know, extraordinarily gifted or anything. So, um, I played, I enjoyed it. Um, I mean, probably my highlights were playing for the Braves in 2001, but otherwise, you know, I, little league was fun too. So, so you mentioned that you did play for the Braves in 2001. Right. So because you played for the Braves, are you like a Braves fan personally, or do you not like, do you not root for a team or do you not like reveal who you root for? I know a lot of people are like, yeah, like I, I root for a team growing up, but like don't root for anyone anymore because I'm not yeah. supposed to. Isn't that weird? That's, to, I mean, you're kind of, you're like that to some extent, like you're, if anything, you're a Cubs fan, right? Right. But, you know, for example, like your fandom, I feel like for Purdue basketball is probably greater than your Cubs fandom. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 I would have rather I'd rather have Purdue basketball win a national championship than have the Cubs win the World Series next year. And that right. partly because the Cubs just won a few years ago. And it's actually on mute on my TV right now on I will be network. <laughs> yeah. Which is very nice. But but yeah, no, for sure. So are you the same way with like the Braves, who you played for uh, nineteen years ago? Right. Yeah. So I mean, I grew up um, I mean I was born in nineteen ninety five. That was the last year the Braves won the World Series. My parents grew up in Atlanta. They were big Braves fans. They were on TBS at the time so everyone was really watching the Braves not even just like people from the Atlanta area so I grew up very much in like a baseball fan Braves fan household and I still I still carried that today I don't feel uh I'm still like as big of a Braves fan as I've ever been and I, I root for them really hard um but it's important for me also I think some of the people who do like baseball YouTube I think John Boy and Giraffe Neck Mark are great examples of this like, their fandom is a huge part of their brand. Like, John Boy yeah. is a Yankees guy, and Giraffe Nick Mark, he's a Mets guy. Yeah. And I don't really integrate the Braves into foolish baseball like that, um, somewhat because I, I try to, I hope in my YouTube videos to stay kind of above the fray of all that, of, like, fandom. And right. so, in some ways, I think it's important to me to make my fandom and my work with foolish baseball separate from one another. So, even I, I think even, like, I intentionally in some ways try not to talk about the Braves even when I really want to. So do you play like do you play fantasy baseball? I know a lot of people like ask, oh you want me on a fantasy baseball? Like I'm dude, I'm so busy. Like I can't I can't yeah. do four fantasy <laughs> baseball leagues right now. Do you do you play fantasy baseball? Last year was the first year I ever played fantasy baseball and it wasn't like um it wasn't like uh, it was like just like a head to head points league. It was like more of the style of like a NFL type fantasy football. I love the that's what I do all the time. Head to head yeah. points. I play fan. I mean, NFL fan. I play fantasy football. Oh, all yeah, the time. yeah. Uh, I love it. Um, but fantasy baseball, we yeah, we kind of had a league like that where basically you just like players will get points for a week or something like that, and then you go head to head. Whereas I understand like the real fantasy baseball pros do like five 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 roto. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't really understand how that works. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I I really enjoyed playing fantasy baseball last year because. It really, like, there's a greater correlation between who's good in fantasy baseball and who's good at actual baseball than there is a correlation between who's good at fantasy football and who's good at actual football Yeah. Um, that I found really uh, interesting. And I also liked, like, I could get on, you know, I, I found, like, great pitchers to pick off the waiver wire just with my knowledge of advanced stats because I could just go look and say, hey, who's getting unlucky, but who has a good FIP, who has a good you know, yeah. uh, Sierra or something like that. Um, so 
that was really enjoyable. You know, it could go on baseball savant, say, hey, who's clobbering the ball, but maybe getting unlucky Just as far as their luck. One, the highest yeah, exactly. On there. And <laughs> you can even sort the differential so you can see really right. who's oh, getting right. the most unlucky. So, yeah, I mean, I played it. I wouldn't play more than one league. And um, I liked kind of the style we did last year. But, yeah, that was my first experience with fantasy baseball, and I had a good time. So are you like a, an Atlanta sports fan, like all around? Like you mentioned football. Do you Are you like a Falcons fan? And like for, yeah. like for basketball, are you like a Hawks fan? Yeah. So I'm not really super into basketball, but I mean, I guess if I did have a basketball team, it'd be the Hawks. The, the Hawks are going to be fun in a few years. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been paying attention like a lot more recently to them, uh, especially this year, just because I think the young core is really starting to come together and you're starting yeah. to picture what the good Hawks team is going to look like. Right. Um but yeah, I mean, uh, Falcons. I'm a pretty big Falcons fan. Uh, I think they just that picked up Todd Gurley, right? They did. Yeah, that was, that's like that's kind of an interesting one. I don't. They have this. They have an offense now where I think every single starter is a former first round pick. <laughs> really? Um, yeah, I, which is I think the first time someone's assembled that. Okay. Um, and it's not like I mean, you think that sounds great, but some of these guys, you know, have been first round picks and then kind of hard up on their luck ever since. But it's it's interesting that that. That organization seems to care so much about the draft pedigree, you know, that they feel like they can t- get some of these players. Like Gurley is an example of that. Uh, the tight end they just traded for from the Ravens, whose name escapes me. I think Hayden Hurst is his name. I, that That's kind of, yeah, he, they kind of, they, I think the Falcons see themselves as like, we could do a reclamation project on a few guys and turn first round potential into like uh, uh, you know, a good football player, even if the first couple of years of their career haven't been good. But yeah, I'm a pretty big Falcons fan. And Atlanta United, too. I really like okay. them in MLS. And Atlanta United, a couple of years ago, I guess that would have been uh, about a year and a half ago, they won. Like, they won the MLS. And oh, Atlanta yeah. I'm had not a big title. soccer guy. I can yeah. tell you anything about basketball or football or baseball. But soccer, I, you could have said that they went, they went winless, and I would have believed you. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I, they went from expansion team to, I mean, they won it in their second year of existence. So. Wow. It was really cool, and it's like that was – I mean, Atlanta hadn't had the title since 95 with the Braves, so that was cool right. too. But, yeah, I would say Braves are definitely my number one team in sports, and then, but I like the Falcons as well. And then Hawks and Atlanta United, I'm very – I would say fair weather. I would say if they're, if they're winning, I'll pay attention, and if not, I'll just kind of forget about it. So for me personally, I find myself – like obviously, I'm a Cubs fan. I, I root for the A's and Angels too because of like Matt Chapman and Mike Trout. So I guess that's kind of what I'm asking. This might be like a little hard, but – for like players, like I, I find myself rooting for players a lot more than teams. What players that like you haven't made a YouTube video about? Yeah. That might be hard because I'm sure you've made a YouTube video about a lot of your favorite players. But which ones that you haven't like talked more in depth about? Do you also like want to see succeed like more than like the average player? Yeah, uh, James Karinchak is one. Oh, uh, I love, I love him uh, too. You I'm don't obsessed. make a video about him. Keep it a secret. I I really kind of want to, and I kind of don't uh, make a video about. I wrote about an James article Karen. about him, like a, a few. Oh, weeks did you? Ago. It was like a okay. small like article. I posted it just like once and didn't promote it at all. But yeah. he is so. Damn, I'm so mad. There's no baseball season because I would have if I played fantasy. I would have stacked up on him so much. I was thinking like maybe when I see more Karen Chack, I can make the video because he's only thrown like five or six innings in the majors is that right yeah uh, it's something to that extent and he still has like a highlight reel with like is yeah. that like yeah. <laughs> someone would take an entire year to, to come up with yeah he's out he's outrageous he's definitely won um david fletcher has been kind of a twitter meme lately i've i was kind of aboard the david fletcher bandwagon pretty early once yeah. he got to, uh david fletcher jeff mathis yeah david fletcher jeff mathis jeff mathis he did david make a video fletcher. on jeff mathis though that's true yeah jeff david um, mathis fletcher <laughs> yeah so I think Fletcher's one. I Fletcher really caught my attention. One day I just went on his baseball reference page, and it was like right when he reached 600 plate appearances, and I was like, oh, this guy has like a like a really good player actually. If you combine it, because he was not like, he played like half of right 2018 and then the first half of 2019. Contact is what caught my eye. I probably like last year, but I never really like yeah. thought he was like or two years ago, but I never really thought he was gonna be like a meme. On, I don't know why that happened, but I think yeah. it's hilarious. Angels Twitter really stepped up its game. Yeah, like you think like Mike Trout, Shohei Otani, Anthony Rendon would be like the guy, but like I think the most oh. famous baseball player on on uh, baseball or the most famous Angels player on baseball Twitter could perhaps be David Fletcher. I think that's correct. Um, yeah, I think when you talk about those players, I think there's definitely archetypes that appeal to me. So like, even though I've done a video on Mathis, another video I would a uh, person I would say is Austin Hedges, you know, and kind of a yep. similar type player. Um, and then with like. 
you know, I like the nasty reliever too. I like Karen Jack. I like uh, Nick Anderson's another one uh, that I, I really like to, and I saw him pitch at spring training, which was, which was really fun too. Um, Fletcher's one. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else that kind of comes to mind. Terrence Gore, no matter what Terrence yeah. Gore is up to, I'm interested. You know, anyone who's just kind of has like a skill set where they have like a massive outlier. They're really good yep. at something, really bad that's at something. I was say. Yeah, that's like typically the type of, us, of player that's for both of us. We have like kind of similar like things we do, and I think the the appeal, like the the things that like get people interested and the things that get me interested, are like the people that are really good at like one thing. That like yeah. this is like he's the best in baseball at this one thing. He may not be a five war player or even a three war player, but sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But like, wow, this guy is the best in baseball at this, this random thing. And mm-hmm. I think that's really interesting to a lot of people like James Karinchak with his strikeout, David Fletcher with, with his contact Mathis and hedges with, with framing. I feel like there's definitely an appeal to, to me, to you and to a lot of people with like, I'd rather see a two war player who has fit like 40 home runs, but strikes out 40% of the time yeah. than a five war player who hits 30 home runs, goes like 280, 350, like 510 or whatever. Like that's mm-hmm. like even the player is worse, but it's still like way more interesting, way more like appealing to people. And I'm sure you see, I'm, I, a lot of your videos are based off of players that like Tim LoCastro <laughs> is just a very extreme player. Not right. like extreme in like <laughs> his political views or something, but just in his baseball, yeah. like his baseball archetype or whatever. He's just a very like polarizing, I guess you could say. Like player, like he'd either have all twenties, like half twenties and half eighties on his like scouting report, like those kind of guys. Right. Yeah. I mean, he's. I. I kind of. I talked about this earlier with someone else. I can't remember who it was, but um, they're asking me like, how do you find these guys? How do you find these players to talk about? Just and then it's like, <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying. Like I said, go on fan graphs, pick a stat, sort by it, find out who's the best at something, find out who's yep. the worst at something, and go from there. You know. Yeah, Joey Votto is another one of those guys who's like oh, obviously course. a much better player than the other guys. But yeah. like his, like I, I like my most famous tweet was that um, the pop up right. stat that he had a couple of years ago, and it was just it's crazy. Like not only is he like ridiculously drawing walks, getting on base, yeah. but it's just he doesn't he doesn't pop up. And you, yeah. I found that I sort by infield fly balls. I'm like, oh maybe I'll find something cool here. And it's like, oh he's like, like like twenty percent as much as the next guy or whatever it was for like. Yeah. A group. You but, know who's another guy is Nick Madrigal too. I got to shout him out too while we're at it. Fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm a lot of people like think like oh like you're a Cubs fan like you can't like root for the Sox, but they're they're gonna be really fun. Him and Luis Robert and Eloy Jimenez, they're all kind of like that. Like they could be like, Jimenez is more like just a stereotypical power bat, but mm-hmm. he could be one of those guys that like hit 60 homers in a season. Nick yeah. Madrigal is gonna hit 310 with an on base percentage of 320 and strike out eight times the entire year. Fun. It's just, it's yeah. Really fun. He might not be the most valuable player. He probably will be mm-hmm. a little bit valuable, but yeah. it's, it's really fun. I mean, that's Tim Anderson too, to some extent he strikes out a lot, but it's like, right. you know, the, I mean, the has, aggressiveness. Yeah. Chicago, just the shortstops are just strike out, but like hit machines and get like, it's just, it's those players are so fun to root for and watch. Like, that's why I love Matt Chapman. I mean, he's the yeah. best defender I've ever seen. Right. Like, I didn't, I didn't watch Ozzie Smith play, but, I've heard Ozzy Smith was better, but Matt Chapman is the best defender I've ever seen. He makes a highlight every three games, and I'm so right. glad that defensive metrics recognize that he is the best player out there. But, but yeah, it's it's super fun, like for those extreme players for sure. So a couple uh, questions to wrap this up that I've asked um, everyone so far. Um, your your favorite baseball memory, whether it was in person or like um, just on TV, like that you remember. Like what what's the first thing when you like? Oh, your favorite baseball memory. Like what comes to mind? Favorite baseball memory. The 2005 Braves were a really fun team for my personal fandom. Um, so um, I grew up like uh, like um, my family moved to uh, Georgia when I was, let's see here, I would have been five. And um, when I was, uh, you know, the Braves minor league teams, like they're pretty like centralized, um, I would say. So like a lot of them are in like, they're kind of in Georgia and like the Southeast and um, so I would go to like a lot of like minor league baseball when I was a kid, uh, at various like affiliates. And, um, so particularly like in Oh three, like Oh four, um, I saw guys like Jeff Francoeur and Brian McCann were kind of the highlights, uh, in the Braves system at the time. And then no five is when they came up and, and helped propel the Braves. Have you seen to... the John Boyce video on Jeff Francoeur? It's fantastic. It's my favorite one I've seen from him. Although, like I said, I haven't, I've probably only seen like five or ten of them um but um yeah i'm so frank core mccann just to see like 
people you watched in a small stadium play in the big stadium on TV. I don't know why that's so that was so cool to me, but it was. Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, I, I talked about this uh, not too long ago on Twitter, but um, someone asked, I think, I can't remember who it was, um, asked first sports memory. And um, for me, it was um, a, a home run robbery by Torrey Hunter of Barry Bonds in the 2002 All-Star Game in Miller Park. Okay. Um, which is a really classic kind of like clip if you haven't seen it. But um, yeah. it's cool because it's like, first of all, it's like they're doing the thing they do. Like Barry Bonds hits home runs and Torrey Hunter robs them. Like that's what they were known for. Yeah. So I think that's really cool. And also it's like uh, I was like seven at the time. And I remember being with like my family and I were on like this road trip in an RV and we were going basically across the country. And it was the day of the All-Star game and I really wanted to watch it. I was a big baseball fan even at that age. And I remember we got to like this RV park and sometimes we had like a cable hookup and we could watch TV and sometimes we couldn't and we were there, we couldn't watch TV. So I was like, oh no, I'm going to miss the all-star game. And so I remember like going like with my dad to like this, like the, like the office, I guess, where you pay for like your spot or whatever. And just like asking the guy to like turn on this like really tiny TV that was in there and just watching the first few innings of that game. And that's kind of like a special memory just because it's like, it's about, you know, basically my dad doing me a big solid and helping me see the game. But also like, I saw that really cool moment, like iconic sports moment because of him. So I think that's definitely a, like a really positive sports memory I have. What I don't have is however, is a positive sports memory of a team that I truly love winning a championship uh, because the Braves last won in 95 when I was uh, a bit, basically two months old. And then, uh, yeah, and then the Falcons blew it in the Super Bowl. So yeah, um, even soon though the Braves are Braves are looking pretty good. You never know. Um, I yeah. mean, the stat there people, Braves fans are talking about now is um, the last time opening day was delayed was 1995. So this is how they win. Um. <laughs> There's no season at all this year. And they're like, oh, yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. But, um, okay, last question for you. Um, in school, whether it was like college or high school, what was the favorite, like, what was your favorite class that you've, or like some of your favorite classes that you've, you've taken? That's a good question. Um, yeah, that's the one I'll play, play on the spot for because that's kind of like out of nowhere, but. Yeah, I mean, I so when I was in high school, um, when I was in high school, I really enjoyed like I talked about it a little bit earlier, but I was in like a a journalism type class that I took like four years. It was an elective, you know, it wasn't yeah, like a, yeah. a core educational type class. Um, also in high school, uh, I enjoyed English was probably my favorite subject, um, and then when I got to college, I enjoyed all the German courses I took as well as history, those, those are the ones I majored in. And then as far as like the non-major courses, I took like, um, I took like an art history, um, just kind of on a whim, like my last semester, or maybe my second to last semester, and I had fun with that one too. I don't really know how this connects to baseball, but yeah, those are the ones I enjoyed. Yeah, I just like asking that question. I know a lot of people listening are probably in high school or college. Oh, I and, see, okay, yeah. And like, I, I just like asking the question. A lot of people, um, I, I bring this up probably like every time that we talk, like I talk about this, but a lot of people are like, oh, like, how do you get into baseball? Like, what do you, what do you All study right. in college? And it's like, I, it, for me, like whenever I, someone asks that question, I'm like, oh, like do whatever you're interested in and then like apply that to baseball. I've talked to a lot of people who are like philosophy majors. I like talked to Dan about this, like in the last video, but it's like some people are like philosophy majors or like neuroscience majors who like work in a baseball front office now. Like, how does that happen? Sure. It's because they're creative people who take what they enjoyed and like use whatever to apply it to baseball. So that's why I like asking that question. Cause I think it's not everyone liked, like took AP stats or like loved AP stats. Like not every yeah. stats person took AP stats or like loved calculus. Like not everyone's yeah. like a, a nerd. Like everyone, like people, I like, I like talking about like the personal like aspect of things that like people don't just love baseball from like a analytical sense. They have other things that they enjoy, which is why I like asking that question. But yeah. and anyways, um, as this interview, um, like just one minute ago, Noah Syndergaard, is um, expected to have Tommy John surgery. So, oh no, yeah, I'm sure uh -huh. that everyone watching this has known this for a couple of days because this won't be out for a couple of days. But huh. figured I would let you know he it's has a torn nowhere. ligament in his right elbow and is expected to have Tommy John surgery. But I guess this is the year to do it, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, there might not even be a missed start for him. <laughs> that kind of sucks. He's had some injury issues. I really, yeah. really hope. I, I always hope every year that he can put. He he's really good when he's not hurt. Yeah. I mean, even last year he was really good and kind of unlucky. Yeah, no, for sure. And he's dirty and only the show too. You can feel like a hundred mile an hour sinker. It's kind of impossible to hit. But anyways, Bailey, thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you have a good rest of your day, rest of your week, and rest of your corona break. 
All right. Thanks, Jeremy.